Welcome everyone to another Aqua Empire event. Pretty good turnout. We know there's not enough parking, but uh, it makes me happy as well. Um, we've managed to get Jordan here, all the way from Scotland, but he's promised to talk English today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Jordan's got quite a big following. I think you're on, what, 40,000, eh? Something like this, yes. Not bad. It's more than us. It's not too big, is it? <laughs> yeah. So he's going to be doing the Scape line today. Um, from a wise, eh? Um, just tell us a bit about yourself. I think. Yeah, of course. So my name is Jordan Stidditt. I'm from Scotland in the UK. So that's uh, north of the UK. Um, uh, yeah, basically, I'm an aquascaper and it's my hobby. It's not my job, um, but I am very, very passionate about it and I love it's doing like it. It's changing now. So, uh, well, maybe, who knows? Uh, it's still a hobby and I still really enjoy doing it and it's about enjoying the journey. So we'll see how it goes in the future. But. Uh, yeah, no, I love it. I really, really love it. And I'm really, really happy to be here in South Africa to show you um, how I make my aquascapes. Um, so I'm really looking forward to meeting you afterwards and chatting also. Um, if you have any questions while I'm doing this scape, don't forget to put your hand up. Um, ask as many questions as you can. Get as much out of this as you can. Um, and uh, yeah, welcome. Very good. Um, so how long do you think this is going to take? This will take about two hours. Um, I'm not sure if we're having a break in between. Are we having a break in between maybe? Or after? Maybe. We can see how it goes. Okay, so maybe two hours, two and a half hours. Um, we'll see how it goes. I've got some help with the plants, so hopefully it make it a bit quicker. Um, but yeah. And we're going to be using an ADA AquaSky light in this tank. We are. We got the... Especially for Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Here it comes now. Here it comes now. And I think we must congratulate Hitton, everyone, yeah. for uh, you know, making these sort of things possible. Um, you know, we... In the past, I mean, we used to do um, skate hops. Uh, but I mean, this is a first for us in South Africa, getting somebody international out to do these, these kind of events. So well done, Hilton. Yeah. Good luck, Jordan. <clears throat> Perfect, thanks so much. Okay, so yeah, we've talked a bit about myself. Let's get started with the scape. Um, first of all, I think um, you can uh, go ahead and add the hardscape first, or you can add a bit of soil um, first uh, to get you a bit of a height for your hardscape. So I think we'll add some soil for a start. Before we add the soil, we're going to be adding uh, Power Sun Advanced. And what this is, it's like a porous uh, lava rock based up, or yeah, porous. And what it does is it, um, you get good circulation around the substrate, um, good bacteria growth, um, and it's just really good for the nutrients as well. The Advanced one it also has three different powders in it. So I'm going back here, back to 100, clear supper, and uh, BC powder. We're going to be going for a triangular shaped layout right here. So we will go from the top left here down to the bottom right. So most of the, the soil I'll be adding would be uh, to the back and to the uh, back le uh, your left. So you don't need too much of this. Um, it's also useful if you don't want to use too much soil. Um, I think it's cheaper than soil, a wee bit cheaper. So using this can uh, sort of some sort of a, you know, you can save a bit of money on the soil as well. And also if you're going for a really, really high background, you can add even more of this and it, you know, you use less soil. And um, it's really good for building height and also it helps the rocks and the hardscape stay in place. Probably a bit, a bit more though. And uh, the tool I'm using right here is that ADA sand flattener. It's just quite useful. You can also use a credit card or a piece of cardboard or anything like this. Um, good thing about ADA tools is they last a lifetime. The soil here. We have Amazonia. Um, this is version two, I believe. Yep. And in the version 2 bag, you have a little uh, bag of root tabs. And what the root tabs does is it gives you a bit of extra nutrients. Uh, great. Yeah, it adds a little bit extra nutrients. So what you do here is you just put it on the bottom layer. You can also use uh, your little tweezers and pop them in afterwards. But uh, either way, it works fine. ADA do have a tool because if you, uh, your substrate only lasts a certain amount of time, if your nutrients uh, deplete, you might want to add more nutrients to the substrate later on. 
they do have a tool that you can use and you can add these later on, maybe after a couple of months. And you can do this every so few months. And this is a really good way to keep your, uh, your substrate really fresh, lots of nutrients. Um, but yeah, they do have a tool or you can just use tweezers. Little uh, root tabs are like little sticks here. So we'll just put a few of these on. We probably won't use a full bag, but just uh, try and uh, spread out as evenly as possible, I guess. We'll probably maybe use just over half a bag or half a bag of soil, I think. Maybe not so much. Obviously, if you're using half a bag of soil, maybe you only use half a bag of these. If you are adding these later on um, to try and renew the soil, make sure you push it down quite far. If you if it gets in contact with the water, you're going to have uh, excess nutrients coming into the uh, water column, and then you might actually have issues with algae. But uh, yeah, make sure you push it down far enough. So grab the soil and we'll just pour this in. Um, I'm going to be pouring it into the front um, just because if I pour it into the back right now, it's going to uh, all this is going to fall to the front. But we can move this back. We're gonna have sand in the front, so I'm gonna move the sand, move the soil to the back in a second. You can also use your hand as well, it's quite useful. <laughs> and if these little rocks come to the top, you can just push them back in with your tweezers or hand or whatever you need to. So what we're doing here is we're creating a bit of a height up the back left here, and we'll start to uh, um, make our way down into a triangular shape layout. I do have a photo on my phone because we did use the, you see the little dojo over here is that you have like a little uh, wire um, shape in the shape of a tank. And you can go over here, you can pick your hardscape and you can make your own hardscape uh, just like you would in your tank um, in this little sandbox basically. Uh, really, really useful when you're at a shop and you're trying to Select your hardscape, and then you can take a picture of it, like I have. Um, we don't, I don't always do this, but um, it is useful, um, especially in a workshop like this, and I don't have much time to think about what I'm doing. Okay. Nothing looks the same, though. You'll, you'll do it in the, uh, in the dojo, it's called, um, and then you'll try and create the same hardscape, and it'll never look the same. But... Uh, Sometimes the light can get in the way of your hardscape as well. It's like up like this. So yeah, you definitely have to kid take the light into consideration when you're doing so. This is the, probably a process that normally would take you a couple weeks. So you maybe make your hardscape and you would uh, give it a couple of weeks and walk past your tank every day. And um, thank you. Yeah, yes. Um, have we got any uh, um, gravel at all? Um, like, okay. yeah, we've got the sand. We've got any like any gravel aqua like for detail? Aqua, aqua gravel. Aqua gravel. Perfect. Yeah, yeah that would be good. <laughs> Only the ADA brand. It's funny. I think uh, what will probably take most time on the hardscape here. If you get a good hardscape, um, it really pays off later. If you have any questions about hardscape design or anything like this, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, I'll just put that here. Yeah, go ahead. Do you pre-soak the wood? You can do, and it's a good idea. Um, by pre-soaking the wood, um, it also holds the wood down. Um, you won't have anything like tannins. Tannins basically make the water kind of brown color. Some people like it, some people don't. But if we have a like, clean glass like this and clean piping, glassware, you don't really want your, your tank to look very brown, like brown water. It doesn't look very clean. So uh, soaking the wood can be good or um, leaving the wood outside to let the, the weather hit it and the rain. And that also helps a lot. But yeah, soaking the wood is a good idea. Um, after this, you might want to put like a rock on the hardscape when you're filling it up because the wood might float, um, which is a massive benefit to, uh, yeah, definitely to uh, soaking the wood beforehand. Yeah. So 
So what I like to do is you can, many people will use uh, glue and um, like a bit of paper. I'll show you about how to do that as well. But also zip ties are really useful because glue can break when you're trying to clean the wood. And um, if you're trying to like uh, use your brush and trying to clean it and then the glue snaps, that's it kind of, you can't really go put glue back in. You could, but you have to drain the whole tank. Zip ties kind of uh, hold their place. They don't, they don't, uh, you know, they don't break. They, they'll stay in place. And when you can actually hold the whole st structure of the hardscape up. So it's really, really useful. Um, so once we got a wee bit more in and get the kind of layout, we'll start to add a bit more of the zip ties to hold everything together. And I'll show you how to use the, the glue if you need to as well. I'm sure I had, this is looking nothing like it was yesterday, uh, the other time I did it. Oh, sorry, the wind's a bit noisy. So you can sort of see this like triangular shaped layer coming down. All the branches are kind of flowing in the same direction. It is good to have a bit of, um, a bit of uh, some wood coming in a different direction because it creates a bit of contrast, a bit of uh, diversity, um, and a bit of conflict. A bit of conflict in escape is really, really good. If you have everything flowing in the same direction, it looks too, too fake. If you have it coming, like maybe this piece that you can see right here, this little piece of wood here, um, it doesn't quite go in the same direction as all these other pieces, and it, it is very, very nice. And what I'm about to do now is do that same thing. So we'll place a piece of wood maybe like this, and it'll have these branches going in a different direction to these other branches. Really, really useful tip. I think what we'll actually do is we'll add some uh, zip ties and zip tie together, but we'll also add a bit more height of the substrate at the back here so we can lift it up a bit. But the zip ties, as long as you get one point of contact, it's generally okay. And you can also use the glue if you can't get the zip tie in. It's all just trying to find the best point of contact. So if I go just around here, um, you, you, uh, you should really try and hide the thick end of the zip tie behind the hardscape and cut the uh, extra pieces off. Sometimes when you add these, it doesn't look quite right. You will have a zip tie, obviously, you can see it right now, but when we add the plants, you can add moss on top of it, you can add uh, epi epi epiphytic plants, and what I mean by epiphytic plants is they attach to the hardscape and you don't have to plant them in the substrate. As I said, this is the process that takes the longest amount of time. But it's important to take your time over your hardscape because the hardscape is the skeleton of the, of the layout. And without a strong hardscape, it's very, very difficult to make a good layout. And especially for you guys watching this right now, if I just uh, say I didn't use any hardscape or I used a small bit of hardscape and then plant it, it wouldn't look very good from the start. And you're, very, you're relying on the plants very healthy plant uh, growth to make the escape look very nice, which is much, much more difficult. Uh, what, what inspired me about Amano? Yes, yeah, I've got his books. Have you read his books? Of course, of course. I've got I've got some of the AD uh, or the early uh, early ADA books, like the World Book One. Um, it's a cool book. You can read a lot of stories. Um, but yeah, of course, um, I would say I would say that ADA uh, or Aqua Design Amano, as well as, well as Takashi Amano that started ADA, is a massive inspiration for the hobby. And without him, there wouldn't be this hobby. Um, but yes, of course, um, this this uh, style is a nature aquarium style. So Amano was actually the creator of the nature aquarium style. Um, the nature aquarium style um, doesn't uh, exactly replicate nature, um, uh, but it is a representation of uh, nature, uh, an essence of nature, in, in fact. So we're making something that's man-made, looks a wee bit man-made, but it has an essence of nature, and it's beautiful to our eyes. There are other styles of aquascaping. I can talk about that. You, so you ha there's tons of, and I couldn't name them all, but um, you have the nature cream style, you have diorama style. Diorama, diorama is, um, it has a lot of depth, and it's uh, about creating, uh, taking like, Elements from the outside, like hill hillsides and paths and uh, forests, almost, um, and then putting them in an aquarium and making the aquarium look really deep, really, really deep. So they generally have really high substrates, maybe a path up the middle and a lot of uh, perspective. Um, there's other styles called like Brazilian style scape, and the Brazilian style scape is really based upon rock structures only. They don't normally add wood, um, and they have really, really vibrant colors, reds, greens, they're really, really pop, lots of stem plants at the back two right corners or through the, through the hardscape. And it usually generally has a path running through the middle or uh, the sides. It's very, very beautiful uh, uh, style. Um, there's many other ones. There's, uh, I was talking about um, 
something that's more uh, closer to nature. There's one called a biotope style. Now what they do is they basically take uh, almost a replica of something they would find in a river stream and around the world, so maybe South American biotope, uh, something like this, and it would look like exactly like you would find in South America. They try and use the right wood, the right soils, the right stones, the right fish that are actually in these natural habitats. Very, very cool. There's tons of uh, styles out there. Um, plenty to try, and I would advise trying a bit of, the, a bit of everything, because it is good fun. Um, this is definitely the most popular style of aquascaping being nature aquarium style. Nearly there, guys. So this will be very, well, this should be very easy to maintain because of all these zip ties. And you, can, you don't have to really worry about uh, cleaning and breaking the glue. Uh, these can be a bit finicky. There we go. And don't worry. Pardon? Yes. Aquascaping in the UK. Aquascaping the UK? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, as I said, I think through the whole world, uh, this nature cream style is definitely the most popular style. Um, but uh, as far as stores, we have a few good stores in the UK, mostly in England. We have maybe four or five good aquascaping stores. Um, but in Scotland, where I'm from, there's, there's, I don't believe there's any specific specialist aquascaping stores. We have aquarium stores um, that stock a wee bit of hardscape. But nothing like this ADA or nothing like Twin Star or uh, Tour Aquarius for the, um, the towel I have right here. Um, and they also sell fertilizers and stuff like this. A waze. Some uh, stores, the fish keeping stores, do stock a waze because of the pond influence. So a lot of uh, fish keeping stores will do ponds. Um, so they also do sometimes stock the filters from a waze. Um, but uh, very few people in uh, Scotland actually aquascape. Um, more, it's more popular in England, I would say. Um, okay, so we have one last piece up here, and I think, you know what, I'll show you how to use the glue. Um, I think this is a good opportunity to show you how to use the glue. So one last look. So yeah, definitely with this one piece, what I'm trying to do is create a bit of contrast. One thing, uh, one thing to note is what, try and make your hardscape so you can get your hand into the glass, because if you're trying to clean this, like this piece right here, it might be a bit difficult. We can definitely move it all over here, and we're able to clean, but uh, do take that into consideration when you're trying to create your hardscape. Maintenance is very important. Okay, so glue. We have two, two types of glue here. We have plant glue and uh, hardscape glue. Um, one is a gel glue, the plant glue, and the hardscape glue is a liquid glue. So the liquid glue is what we're gonna be using here. You can take uh, toilet tissue paper, you can take cotton, um, you can use uh, cigarette filters. And when you're doing this, there's a little nozzle here, actually, for me. Let's put it on top, it might be a bit easier. When you're doing this, you take a small amount of uh, any type of paper, cotton, kitchen towel, or a cigarette filter, whatever you have. And when you're doing this, be very careful. Um, don't glue your fingers together. But also, don't breathe in the smoke that comes off of it. When you add this to the, to the paper, or any cotton, there will be like a, a pl burning plastic smell. So definitely don't try, don't breathe this in. It's definitely not good for you. Uh, there was somebody who was telling me at the, my workshop yesterday that they glued their eyelids together with glue and they were doing this. <laughs> I can't believe that. I've never heard this story before. But uh, yeah. So we, we, leave, we leave the, the piece of hardscape like this in the right place. Um, you can't exactly uh, put this down and glue it, then put the hardscape on. You've got to um, keep the hardscape in place and then use the glue as it's, as the piece of hardscape's in there. Do you know what I mean? Um, you can't like uh, place this down, put the glue on, and then put the hardscape back in where you, where you have it. You've got to kind of just push it into a little gap. And when you do this, um, this will work for rocks as well. Um, it will go solid. So it almost, this, this tissue paper, when I put this glue on, will become solid. And you, if you look very closely when I do this, you might be able to see a bit of smoke eventually come out. You see the smoke, guys? Yeah, definitely don't breathe this in when you're doing it. And uh, one more thing to notice is, when you're using this glue, the liquid glue, try not to use it too much as it drips down your hardscape. It might leave a white mark. The reason also I like to use uh, zip ties and not really glue is when you're trying to use this hardscape again for your next scape, 
um, you might be, it's a lot easier to remove the zip ties than it is to try and scrape glue off um, of wood or rocks. Um, I'm gonna put one more piece in, I think, just to hold it in place. But yeah, there's definitely a really strong bond between this once you do this, uh, this technique. Jordan, what was your first fish? What was my first fish? Yes. Um, do you have plates yes. in here? Yes. So my first fish, I got four plates. Um, when I was, uh, I wasn't aquascaping at this point. Um, one day, I, it was an impulse buy. I was just like, oh, I'm going to buy a fish tank today. Um, and I bought a rubbish little fish tank. It had, uh, like, you know what climb puke gravel is? <laughs> like the colorful gravel, gravel that's horrible. Um, yeah, I had that. Uh, I think I had one piece of like mon monopi wood or monopi wood. I can't remember how you pronounce it. Um, but I had that. A little internal filter. Eventually, I got. I went back and I got. A, you can see the smoke now, guys. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of smoke there going in my eyes, huh? Um, so I got those four fish, and then I went back and I got a goldfish. I got a black moor goldfish in this little 26 liter tank. And it grew and it grew, it grew big. I ended up giving it back to a better fish store than I bought it from because a lot of fish stores, they might not give you the best advice. And they might, yes, of course. So um, get, get a, uh, go to a good supplier, a good fish store like this. They'll give you the right advice and they won't, uh, you, won't you won't go wrong. Okay, so that's the hardscape in place. What I was talking about, you can literally just pick up the whole hardscape. It's in place. Um, this, this, this is a totally a rock solid, this piece right here as well. Um, Hitton, do you have any, uh, where is Hitton? Do you have your aquascaping tweezers, your, your, your uh, scissors that I can use? I just want to kind of ruin my ADA scissors, uh, just to, to break the zip ties. Um, I'm going to be uh, trying to fix the soil here, because when I was doing all this, all the soil came to the front, and uh, all the rocks underneath. The rocks aren't a big issue, but the um, little tiny, uh, pieces of the uh, the nutrient tabs, they will be an issue if you leave them in the water column or sitting on top of the substrate. So make sure they're down into the substrate. I think I'll lift the wood back out, add a wee bit more soil underneath as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're good. Mm -hmm. uh, one second, let me just let this take a second. I'll put it down here. Yeah, I've got loads of uh, root tabs everywhere. I uh, just cut the zip ties, yeah. So what I'm doing here is I'm uh, just pushing the root tabs back into the soil. We definitely don't want those touching the water column. And we'll be adding more soil on top of this anyway, so it will be fine. Probably used a bit too much of the power sand here. Hitton's probably shaking his head. <laughs> you made a mess, Jordan. You made a mess. You're doing, doing this all wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, well, so we'll put, we'll put the uh, hardscape back in. We'll add a bit more soil on so I can get rid of all these little stones and then we can have a bit more planting room. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for cutting that for me. Really, really helpful. You could just basically take this whole thing out and clean it, huh? <laughs> Try and put this back in place. Perfect. Perfect, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Perfect, okay. So we'll add a bit more soil just to cover the, the rocks. I might even take my tweezers and Push these back in. Uh, pardon the question? I have, yes. I've done, um, I've done low tech setups. Um, I did a few. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Wait, where did I put my thing? Oh, there we go. Yeah, that was that was a near mistake, huh? Um, so, yes, I have done uh, low tech setups. By low tech, we mean lower lights. Not as many nutrients um, and no CO2, um, so it, it can work. But you got to you got to pick the correct plants. Um, you got to pick plants that do well without CO2. All plants will do better with CO without. Sorry, all plants will do better with CO2 and stronger lighting. Normally, um, it is possible to do a beautiful tank without CO2 though. 
Um, the one I personally did was a Pontank layout. It's also another style of aquascaping. And the reason I didn't use CO2 is because a lot of the plants I was using is what you'd find in a pond. Like I would use uh, water, uh, water celery, uh, stripy reed, um, types of rush, and um, things like this, uh, cypress, things like this. Um, and they all come out of the water. It was a shallow tank. And um, the, most of these plants that come out of water, obviously, they have access to CO2 in the air. So there's not as much of a need to have CO2 in the tank. But it is possible to have other tanks without CO2. And also flour. No. Um, which ones? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so a lot of uh, aquatic plants can actually grow out of water, unless they're true aquatic plants. True aquatic plants can be lilies, they can be uh, like Valsinaria, um, but most, almost all, maybe 90% or maybe more, 99% maybe, um, of aquatic plants that you have in the shop right now can actually grow above water. And you'll see them, they actually, they're actually grown above water in the nurseries and, uh, and that's how they grow them, that's how they propagate them. Where's my tool gone? I'm losing things already. Who stole it? <laughs> Is you? Oh, it's on the floor. I'm already more, more, more like uh, stamping on my ADA tools. Okay, great. Um, they just disappeared, did they? Okay. I might just make a few more disappear. These are my tools, though, so hopefully I don't lose them, huh? No one steals them. I'm looking at these guys. I heard, yeah. See, I'm kind of like, almost like struggling right here to get my hand in. It is a problem in certain tanks where you put your hardscape next to your, uh, next to your glass and you can't get your hand in when you're trying to clean. So it's really important to take that into consideration when you're doing your hardscape. Okay. I do use, yes, um, so it depends what kind of water comes out your tap. Um, so in Scotland, we do have really good water. I could be use, I could use the water we have from the tap. Um, in certain locations in Scotland, it's better, well, much, much better. It's almost uh, like 43 TDS in some areas that I used to be living in. Where I live right now is like 140, 130. I believe in South Africa, in this area, you have about 110 out the tap, I would think. So you could definitely use tap water here. I use our water just for the reinsurance that I know what's in the water because you can get extra nitrates in the water, um, other things as well. Um, by using our water, I remove all the minerals, everything out of the water with almost pure water, and then I add some minerals back through using like a salt, a GHKH salt. Okay, guys, that's uh, the hardscape done mostly. We have some rocks down here as well. Um, the rocks we have here are just a uh, basic lava rock. But they're quite nice, these lava rocks. Sometimes you get lava rock, but it's very, very porous. This is Ragnarok. porous too. Ragnarok. This is what, sorry? Ragnarok. This is called Ragnarok here. It's still a type of, it's still a type of lava rock, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is much nicer than the gin. Can you? <laughs> so yeah, but this is much nicer. Like a lot of the lava rock you get in a lot of stores has like little pores. You can see it's little holes all over it and it's very, very light. It's very cheap that way because it's light, but uh, it's not as nice. Um, this gives it a bit more texture, so you can see you have like a strata almost. Some rocks, um, maybe not lava rocks so much, but they have like a strata. They have lines in a certain direction. You can use this to your advantage and use the same lines in your scape and your wood to your rocks, flowing in the same direction, just like I did here. And also having a bit of a contrast, like this piece of wood I did here as well. But uh, for now, I've already forgotten where I put these earlier, but we'll have a look. If you can see this little uh, diagram here, this is me on the dojo, and this was the escape before um, when I was trying it out. So it's very similar, but still a good bit different. So as you can see here, so this rock right here, we have a high point and we have like a low point. We could use this to the, back, the, the left hand side and the smaller to the right hand side to give us that, accentuate that sort of triangular shaped layout. And getting it in here might be a bit of a trick. Oh, my, see? See what I mean about the, um, the glue? The glue just came off, and whereas my zip ties are solid, so we'll have to re-glue that. Um, we'll put the rocks in first and I'll keep going there. So once again, we're using that strata line. This has got a wee bit of a strata on this uh, rock right here. 
Hopefully it fits under here. And we've got one more rock. It's important actually to mention when you're using rocks or also sort of wood, if you're doing like maybe uh, only a few sticks, important to use odd, only odd numbers. If you use an even number, it doesn't look quite right. It doesn't look very natural. Odd numbers of rocks, we've got three rocks. It looks much more natural than if we used uh, four rocks or six rocks. Very important in Iwagumi layouts. That's another uh, style of aquascaping. An Iwagumi layout would be uh, only rocks. That was also made popular by Takeshi Amano. Break the glass while I'm at it. Uh, let's have a look at that. The main hardscape here is the wood though. The rocks are simply just to support the wood. I think that's okay. Does it look okay? Okay, so the next part, um, some people may go ahead and add the sand and the gravel. But what I like to do is plant first. I find that if I'm planting and I've already added the sand and the soil, uh, sorry, the sand and the gravel, and um, when I'm planting the little pieces of soil will then go onto the sand, make a mess, so I leave that to last. Um, where is my, where's my helper? <laughs> Nikita is gonna be helping me today with the plants. Um, so thank you for, thank you for that. Um, we're going to be we're going to be starting with some of the stem plants. So I believe we have two or three stem plants in here. We have yeah. So we'll use the, the red one. Yeah, Colorata. We'll do this one. I'll help you do it, and uh, we'll get this little box over here for a bin. Uh, we'll do the Colorata. So what we have here is Rotala Colorata. It's um, it looks it looks green right now because it's grown above water but it will turn bright red if you have strong light. And also, um, this, this sort of retala does well under nitrate limitation, but you've got to be careful. Nitrate limitation is where you, nit you limitate the nitrate um, that you're uh, fertilizing, you're losing liquid fertilizer in the water. You limitate the nitrate in the water and the plant will turn red if you have a strong light. And combine light with light nitrate limitation and you will have very, very red plants that turn, that do well under nitrate limitation. Be careful because if you, nit if you limitate the nitrates too much, you might actually start to uh, no notice uh, deficiencies in plants. Um, and say the, the Rotala chlorata is looking very good under nitrate limitation, maybe my, another, another plant is suffering. So be very careful, it's all about balance. Does the uh, CO2 system also That's awesome, thank you. Plus? Let's put this down here, huh? Jordan? Pardon? Does CO2 or pressurize CO2? CO2, of course, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yes, all plants will do better and uh, produce better coloration under CO2, so to have uh, red plants, CO2 is important, although you can still get um, red plants without CO2, but they just might not be as nice a vibrant color. Yeah, it's possible. Only some plants, every plant's different, you know? Every scenario is different. Yeah, so to plant, you simply just push down um, fairly far. Um, once you've got the plant in the substrate, you kind of just give it a little jiggle upside down, up and down, and then the plant will stay in there. You can also use your finger, so if you just uh, push the plant down, you can put your finger on top and then pull your tweezers back out. Um, I like to plant in dry soil. I just find that when I'm planting, the soil doesn't stick to all the tweezers. Um, Hitton will uh, like to plant in like wet soil. What he'll do is he'll fill the tank a tiny touch, and then he'll plant. Um, everyone does it differently. Um, I've tried many ways. It's just my preferred way of planting in dry soil. But of course, you, you can try, it's worth trying a few different methods for yourself and uh, picking the best one for you. Yes? How do you decide which plants you put where? So for example, these are stem plants. These will grow tall. Once we uh, trim these, what we'll do is we'll trim these plants. Once you trim one stem plant, you'll get two little stem, stems come from the place you trim. And you trim again, trim it again, trim it again, it'll get more bushy. So what we'll have here is we'll have a bush coming down into the same kind of uh, sort of uh, triangular shaped layout. It'll look very nice, very, very dense. And that's why I'm using this plant right here. Um, other plants you have like grassy plants. It's, all, it's just totally up to the aquascaper and your vision for the tank. 
Um, different plants do well in different uh, scenarios. Um, also, choosing plants, I, I suppose it's important if you're using CO2, if you're using a highlight, um, what your layout is. For example, I probably wouldn't use like rare plants in this tank. Um, I, I, I would try and use really fast growing plants because we don't have um, a lot of plant mass. We're gonna have sand down here. We're gonna have some plants in the hardscape, but it's important to add some fast growing plants to help you at the start. Awesome, thank you so much. Got a little this one, huh? Yeah. Okay, I quite plant, plant quite densely. That's another thing to note. Um, you, you can plant very densely. Um, and if you plant densely at the start, you can have a much, much better success later down the road. Less algae problems. Plants out, plant will outcompete algae. So they will do very, very well. Ooh, it's okay. We're all good. Were you noticed by any algae in your tank, which obviously happens in the beginning? Yes. What is your first few steps? You test the water, what you look out for, to see what's the distribution. Okay. Yeah, so there's lots of different types of algae. Um, the one you'll get at the start, you might see like maybe your first two weeks will be fine, and then you'll get some diatomaceous algae. What diatomaceous algae is, it's a brown type of algae, um, and it, it comes off the rocks and the, and the wood very, very easily. Um, so that will go away with time. Um, so don't worry about that one. Um, there's a few other types of algae you can get. You can get um, they come in certain groups. So diatomaceous is one. Filamentous algae is another. This one will be the green strands, filaments of algae, like hair algae. Um, you have uh, red algae, and in this category you'll have things like staghorn and black beard algae. Um, you can also get uh, floating algae, which will be like green water. Um, yeah, things like this. Uh, each one has a different scenario how to fix it. Mostly, just if you do constant maintenance, weekly maintenance in the long run. I do like a one third to maybe half, 50% uh, water change per week. Um, at the start though, uh, if we see we're using really nutrient rich soil, what we'll do is we'll do a one third water change. We'll follow the ADA guidelines. We'll do a one third water change every day in the first week. We'll do it every day in the second week, every third day in the third week. And then from there on, we'll do it every week. Um, if you have any questions after, or if you want to, let me just explain this after you. Don't forget to just uh, message me on Instagram. I can help you afterwards. It's hard to remember everything I'm talking about. I totally understand. Um, but I'm happy to help if you message me on Instagram. I'm very uh, good at answering quickly. <laughs> Don't forget to answer questions, guys. And the more questions we ask, um, I guess the better it will be, yeah. What plants do you want next? Uh, we want the, uh, we'll go for the Ritala green next. So this one was Ritala colorata, and this will get a nice red, pinky tone. Maybe uh, depending on your light, depending on everything else, it might go a bit uh, orangey maybe. Um, the next one we're gonna be planting is Rotella green. And Rotella green uh, obviously as the name suggests, stay, stays green, even under nitrate limitation, even under high light, um, uh, Rotella green will be very green. All these are um, on kind of uh, Rotella rotundifolias. So you'll have uh, Rotella rotundifolia, the base, uh, you know, everyone uses it, it's so popular. These are also Rotella rotundifolia, but the Rotella rotundifolia green, Rotella rotundifolia, um, orange juice, they get loads of different uh, HRA, loads and loads and loads of different varieties of Rotella rotundifolia. And they all have different colors. So as you can see here, if you were looking from the top, it's very, very densely uh, planted. Okay, so all the green, so Rotella green, Rotella rotundifolia green here. All these leaves will look quite uh, cir circular right now. It's because they're grown out of water. Once these grow underwater, we'll have uh, longer leaves and they'll produce a much, the green will be a lot brighter green than this. And this one will be obviously red, orange, depending on the conditions. And you don't need to be planting as densely as I am. But uh, definitely, more, more more plants you put in, the the better it'll be. Well, that Nature style aquarium was the first aquarium I did, um, but I've been aquascaping for about uh, three to four years. Not too long. Um, I went uh, three three to four years ago. I started my Instagram page, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm here now. So um, so happy to be here. So happy to be here and doing this kind of thing for you guys. The best way to improve, I suppose, is to get someone knowledgeable that you can talk to, you can ask loads of questions to online or a friend um, or an aquarium store such as this one. You can come here and ask all the questions and they'll give you the right answers and you can follow their philosophy. 
Um, try not to mix too many philosophies together. So say I have this ADA soil right here, um, and I'm using a different fertilizer, or, or even better example would be if I'm using a different uh, soil, like um, a weaker soil, and I use ADA fertilizer, it might not have the best, um, best results. So best to stick with the ADA philosophy, use the ADA soil, use the ADA fertilizer, or at least use a fertilizer in, the, in a way that ADA would be similar. Um, by this I mean ADA um, like to use, uh, there's four bottles in ADA basically. Um, two of the bottles you use at the start for the first two, three months. Then after the first two or three months, you'll start to add iron and nitrogen. Um, these, these nutrients come later. So I, could, I suppose you could use a different fertilizer brand um, but use uh, a fertilizer or an all-in-one fertilizer such as APT Complete um, later after three months and before the th uh, for the first uh, three months start use something like APT Zero that doesn't have nitrogen or phosphorus in it. It's a bit complicated, I understand. I know, hard to remember, but uh, this, uh, sh this store uh, stocks all these products and they can give you good, the best advice as well. Jordan, will you be putting a vinyl background on the chair? Uh, vinyl background. Um, I don't know if the store will be doing this, but uh, it's a good idea. Um, so there's a couple of different idea, uh, couple of different things you can add to the background. You can add a foggy film, and this is like a what you put on a window. It's like a foggy. It looks foggy. Basically, there's no better way to explain. And it's a sticker you place on the back of the tank. There's a, another one that I like to use. Um, is a white background. It's just plain white, and it's really really nice because it gives you almost a fake illusion of having what we call an ADA light screen. And a light screen is literally a, a back panel you put on and it's a light and it illuminates. You can even get like a blue to white and like a sky. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, so there's loads of products you can add. You can also have black backgrounds as well. But uh, when you're using CO2 and you use a black background, the CO2 bubbles are very noticeable. So I prefer using whites or... There's no, there's no issues not using a background. It's totally fine as well. Uh, I need to look at the plants in one second. Let's just look. Forgetting which ones we had, huh? Um, the, let's use you got the liliopsis. Mini, you got liliopsis grass. Let's use the liliopsis. You got some dwarf air grass. And uh, yeah. okay, we'll, this we'll, is we'll, all the epicytes, right? Yeah, we're going to use some, well, we bit liliopsis, and then we'll use the uh, hair grass afterwards. Oh, right. uh, sorry, we'll put this back here. So we're still planting the retala green right here. Is this the, yeah, it's a uh, rotala green. Yeah, perfect. And for these, if you're on a budget, you can also trim, so you have the, the long stems. You can trim some of these in half and you can replant the tips as well to give you a better spread if you need to um, and save a bit of money. But of course, as I said, planting densely is really important from the beginning. And uh, adding on to the fertilizer thing I was saying, um, I fertilize from day one. So I fill the tank from day one, and I fertilize from day one. Okay. Let's use the tweezers and just do this. Mm. Awesome. It's, not, it's okay if we leave a little bit on, it's fine. So the next plant here, we have Liliopsis brasiliensis. This is a grassy plant. It goes really, really thick. Um, what I'm doing here is, so they're, they're taking out the rock wool. So you get this rock wool pot. I haven't explained this, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's, let's get one. Thank you. So you get this rock wool pot. You can take the, this will give you a little description of what the plant is. Um, these are all from Epic Aquatics, which uh, stock this shop right here. So just uh, pinch the pot and the pot comes out. You get some stones and you throw it on people. Um, you uh, take this rock wool, you can break the rock, rock wool up. Um, some plants are easier to come out, so We'll uh, take the rock wool. You can try and pluck off as many pieces of rock wool as you can, but it is quite difficult because you can't really get into the roots. The roots are so, so, uh, so many roots. So you can take sharp tweezers like this, and you can kind of just do this, make a big mess, cover the audience. <laughs> um, so we have a clean, clean root system. Don't worry if there's a wee bit left on, but try and get the most off of it. These are all from pots, so these are all grown immersed above water. Um, you can also get uh, plants such as um, in, in, in vitro or uh, what, what do they call it, like a laboratory grown pots. Tissue cultures, they're also called. Um, these pots are grown in laboratories. They have no algae, no, sn no snails. Um, very, very good quality. You get a lot for your money. Um, they are becoming more popular. Um, I don't know if they're as popular here as they are in the UK, but I normally would buy the, um, the tissue cultures myself. 
Um, although some plants you cannot get in tissue culture, they just don't work as well in laboratory conditions. Um, so either work fine though. This may look like a lot of plants in one of these pots, but once you get the tissue culture pots, there's a lot and a lot of stems in the tissue culture pot. Even though they're a little small, you get a lot of individual, individual plantlets. So it's good for the money. Okay. Yes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll clean this up afterwards. Don't worry. And I'll pick up with my tweezers. <laughs> it was to show the people, dude. <laughs> This is uh, going to be really nice, going to be really dense. It does grow a wee bit taller than other grasses, I suppose. Um, I'm obviously planting quite densely here. You can break up these into individual plantlets um, if you have a, if you're doing this at home. Um, I'm not doing it here, but uh, a good way to plant uh, carpeting plants would be to start from one from the left, one from the, the right, um, whatever way you're, you're uh, looking at this, and then you half it each time. So I plant one on the left, plant one on the right, plant one in the middle, then I half it again, half it again, half again. It gets really in, uh, really even um, plant, uh, planting. Um, but right now we're planting from this side to this side, so we'll be using a different plant after this for the left-hand side. What I'll probably do here is spray the soil a tiny touch here to stop the soil going too much further when I'm trying to uh, plant into this section. That is a benefit of, use it, of uh, wetting the soil and planting it to dry, uh, sorry, wet soil, is it doesn't uh, kind of fall when you're trying to plant into it. Um, well, do we have the little spray bottle somewhere? Yes. Awesome. I'm just spraying the front section just so it doesn't fall. The back section I'll keep dry. And I'll spray these rocks. So you can see if I spray these rocks, they get a lot darker and the wood will get a lot darker as well. Underwater. Maybe that's, that's okay for this one. You think it sticks to... Uh, I think... Uh, I think all soils are pretty, pretty stick. Uh, well, when you're planting, if you're planting underwater, um, what some soils can be quite light and very difficult to plant into. Um, like if I'm if I if I'm changing plants around in my tank after I've planted it, if it's filled with you know it's a few a year old or a few months old, it's already filled in, and I remove a plant, I'm trying to plant put a new one in. Some soils can be quite light, and they don't. When you're trying to put the plants back in, it doesn't really stay down. So yes. It, ADA soil is great. Very strong soil though, very, very nutrient rich. Um, very good product. Let's go for the dwarf hair grass next. Dwarf hair grass will be a bit uh, of a, a thinner blade of grass. Uh, it'll stay a wee bit shorter, a lot shorter than this one actually. Um, it's very, very popular for, um, it's very, very popular for carpeting. Especially in small tanks, it does well in small tanks as well. I'll show you what I mean about the uh, planting the carpets right here. So plant one on this side, one on this side, and then we'll half it each time and it gets a really, really even uh, distribution of the plants. Is it all the dwarf hair grass? Okay. Let's go for maybe two pots more of hair grass. So. So as I'm here, so you can see here, so I half it and then I half it again. So we've got four, but they're evenly spaced, very nicely planted. And especially at the start when you're taking a photo after it's planted, it looks really nice. And it looks like you've taken your time and you're taking good care of when you were planting. This one is Echinodorus uh, sharp leaf. Is, it, is that what it's called? I think that's what it's called. I haven't yet to use this one before in my, myself. Don't think it's very popular, or I haven't seen it in the UK before. They probably have it, but. Um, it's more of a, it's a grassy plant as well. Looks like it has a little flower on it, but I'll just pinch that off because it's a bit long. It will be similar-ish to the um, this plant right here, the tenilis. And we'll plant this maybe in sections like down here, um, just to give it a bit more variation in plants. And how much have we got of this one? One pot, two pots, two pots. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yes. Got a guy, it's a Congo, right? Uh-huh. Got a name on set. You've asked to be put on video call with you. Okay. You want to hear your accent. 
He wants to hear my accent. But do the harsh one. No. Do the harsh one. Yeah. No, I don't really speak with a Scottish accent too much. It is a Scottish accent, but it's not like a harsh one. Um, there are some guys that uh, will have much more of a stronger accent. Scotland has a varied, varied accent. There's a, in different places of Scotland, you'll have different types of accents. You're gonna put me on a, a live call with him, huh? Shit. Am I ready? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Should I do the strong accent or? Oh, I'm messing up here. How are you doing, good? He's in the Congo. You're in the Congo, huh? Say so, we must you. You're in, you're in the Congo, huh? The Congo. Nice, nice. <laughs> nice, nice to meet you. Okay, awesome. Listen, I don't know if you want to use this one. It's got just like snails in it. Uh, Can we use something else? I got let, we'll, 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 use, we'll use it. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Try and pick the snails out. One by one, Hitton. <laughs> Maybe this is kind of nice, actually, the little flowers. Okay, we'll only add a little bit of this, just for a bit of uh, variation, huh? That was all, wasn't it? With the, oh, we've got one down here. So we're still sticking with the Echinodorus tenuous sharp leaf right now. I've got one more pot of this to add. Uh, a lot over here. Okay. Jordan, you must just let us know when you're gonna take a break for lunch. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. You guys hungry yet? <laughs> You are, you are hungry. Always hungry. Always hungry. Okay. Well, we'll maybe have a break in between, I guess. Yeah. It's looking good. I'd like for the aircraft to come a bit more forward, but. Uh, it, it'll, it'll, it'll run. Um, we've got. That's no, okay, it's okay, it's okay. It, nice it can, it can always. Uh, it'll, it'll run. It'll, the carpet, this carpet right here, it will uh, join little runners, so it'll start to cover the um, hole of the front here as well. We'll add some uh, gravel so you won't even see this front part of the soil. Okay, next plant. This next plant we have here is uh, AR Mini. Um, it is actually a red plant, but when it's going above water, it's uh, obviously green. The leaf shape are quite similar into water, but it might get a bit more uh, wide and a bit shorter, possibly. And the plant won't be this long. It will stay very, very low to the ground. This is quite tall, huh? so um, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll trim um, a few leaves off and we'll uh, plant it a wee bit shorter. This one's broken. Yeah, it'll look, it'll look more a uh, short plant at the front. Um, it can go very tall, it'll grow small, shorter if you have a stronger light. Um, but this will stay red even without CO2. Um, it doesn't necessarily need really high lighting either. It's a very cool plant. So this is just for details. It will be very red, so use red sparingly, I think. What's your favorite plant? What's my favorite plant? Well, it's very hard to pick a favorite plant. Um, so, I don't know. It changes every 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 time, every few weeks. <laughs> um, I'm quite enjoying uh, collecting rare plants right now. Um, but it's extremely hard to pick a favorite. There's a, there's a nice one, a few nice ones I have right now. Uh, um, I would say Bacopa salamanii purple, very rare plant, hard to get. Um, it's very nice, um, I do like that one. Sal Salamani purple. Yeah, but is it the real? Is it the purple purple? Okay, good. You got a lot. You liar. Yeah, it's a. It's not the cheapest plant, huh? Um, but it is a very very nice one. So you get a lot of variations of uh, Bacopa. You get the Calarina, which is a uh, a bit uh, green, and then you get a broad spectrum in between those. You get anywhere between like green with purple, and then you get the true purple one which is uh, hard to get, but uh, beautiful, beautiful plants. I'm like, I think that was probably my favorite one right now. So I'll just probably take these teas off. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. 
afraid that if I put one there, it'll look too, like, even, like, one, two, three. It'll be okay. Welcome back. I hope you had a good break. Um, next, we are going to be uh, adding some of this gravel and the sand, and then eventually we'll uh, plant the actual hardscape, the wood and all this with uh, epiphytic plants. But we're going to be using the gravel first. So what we have here is ADA aqua gravel. It's very natural looking gravel. Very nice. And this will, uh, as well as looking nice, it will also give us a bit of a barrier between the soil and the sand, so the, sand, the soil doesn't come, come over into the sand. So why do you do the gravel before the sand? Gravel before the sand, because the, sand, the, the gravel will hold back the soil, and it's much easier to uh, layer this on, and then layer the sand on top of it, um, than the other way around. You could do it the other way around, but you'd probably be going sand, gravel, sand, gravel, and um, to try and get it looking right. This is just a quicker way, I feel. And you can put the gravel a wee bit on top of the, uh, the um, aqua soil, just to make it look a bit more natural as well. You might actually save, save more gravel if you use the sand first, possibly, but I find that this uh, is probably the way I like to do it. The great thing about the AD tools is they also have another uh, smaller um, bit that you can get into smaller spaces with and make smaller adjustments. The sand we're going to be using today is ADA Colorado sand. This one has a bit more of a warm tone, I would believe, I would say. And the other one you can get is more, maybe more popular one. It's called La Plata sand. But both are very, very nice products. Just uh, they just look different. That's all. A wee bit different. Jordan, I think for your style, Colorado is good. You think so? Yeah. So you should probably choose the sand based upon the rocks you use, and yeah, yeah. yeah um, whatever you think looks best. Both would look, I think, nice in this layout. Um, and this is also purely cosmetic. It's purely cosmetic. So you'll see when I'm adding it, it might, yeah, I'll move it to the back, but you'll see I only cover the glass. I'm not adding a lot of uh, sand. And for this, is it's just cosmetic. There's no need to add tons of it. You see a lot of beginners add a lot of uh, cosmetic sand. It just doesn't look very nice. And you're, you're by adding loads, you're also ruining your, you lose a lot of space up, uh, from top to bottom if you add a ton of sand. But it is just cosmetic, so you don't need tons of it. And when I move it back, you'll see it's a very, very small amount on the front of the glass. It just might look a bit more like I'm, because I'm just pouring it in the front right now. A bit more here. Okay. So we'll move this back like this. And you can see, you barely even see a layer of it on the front glass here. And it looks way more natural this way. And I'll, I'll come back and I'll add some more of the gravel because we've lost a bit. You can use this to like, just mix it up a bit as well. And as you can see here, I'm also doing the same thing I did with the gravel at the back, the soil at the back. Everything is coming low at the front and higher at the back because this gives us more uh, more perspective. In uh, layouts such as diorama styles, it's way more important as you're kind of wanting even more perspective. So some of the dioramas even have the soil like almost up to the top of the tank. Uh, gravel. So I'm just going to put some in my hand here and sprinkle it in areas and it'll, you'll see what it looks a lot nicer, a lot more natural. When you're doing it, try not to be too uh, precise. Um, if you sprinkle it and just let it go, it looks more natural. The 
and typically it would be around the rocks. So try and focus your area around the rocks. Okay. Now we will go ahead and start planting the hardscape layouts. So the plants we're going to be using now do well if you uh, you can plant them and they don't have to be in soil. They'll get all their nutrients from the uh, the water column if you use liquid fertilization. And you should use liquid fertilization. So this one we got here is microsorum needle leaf, is it? I believe. I think so. There were many of them. Yeah, I think it's microsorum needle leaf. Uh, just a wee bit uh, slimmer than the um, the standard Java fern. They also call it. Um, and you get different varieties of microsorum. You get trident fern, uh, window love, they're all different leaf shapes. They all look pretty nice, and they're nice, big, uh, um, slow growing, easy plants. Very nice. And you can just put, put, put this into like gaps in the hardscape. So you can just use your hands, you can just push it in here, and it looks quite nice. <clears throat> you can use large, large groups of it as well. We have one that's called one that's trident fern, so if we get one leaf. You can see uh, it almost has like three little spikes of the leaf, whereas this one is just a normal leaf that doesn't have any offshoots. But this one here does have little uh, side leaf parts. Trident's like a little mermaid. Trident's like a little mermaid. Of course, of course. <laughs> They're a very easy plant to use. A lot of beginners you like this plant. Um, that was all the tridents. Okay, cool. It does add a bit of bulk to the layout, so it's very nice. The next plant we have here is a uh, Hygrophila pinnatifida. It's a very nice plant. It also can be used as an epiphytic plant. Um, this one, we're, this one looks quite big right now. Once, if you have this plant in your tank, you can trim the larger leaves. You keep trimming the larger leaves; it will get more compact. It will really grab onto the rocks and the wood. Um, so, and it will creep along the wood and the rocks as well. Very cool plant. It will also get a wee bit brown, a wee bit red almost in some cases. Nitrate limitation will also help to get this uh, a bit red. There is two versions of this. There's the UK version. It's not United Kingdom. It's another place. I uh, can't exactly remember where it's from. Uh, didn't might know. But uh, the, the UK version does get a bit more red than the standard Hygrophila pinnatifida. And yeah, it's the normal version. Yeah, this is the normal version. Okay, okay. Where does the UK one come from? from India. India. And the the abbreviation for the places in India, in India is the UK, but it's not the United Kingdom. We also get different color out of it depending on the lighting and the yeah. nutrients. Yeah, yeah. The normal one you can get white. You can get red. You can get red. It goes more browny red though, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, this one. Okay. Pardon? The one Oh really? Wow. Uh, um, yeah. Maybe from the lights. I don't know. It helps. It helps having like a more bluish lights if you want purple color. Aqua sky. Okay. Nice. <laughs> it's a nice leaf shape though. And um, that's all of that one. I'll help you, don't worry. Um, we've got some Hydrocotyl tripartita next. This one grows really fast. Very, very good for beginners. It, it can grow a bit too fast in some cases. Yeah. So you need to keep on top of it, keep trimming it. Um, just like the other ones, other plants, the more you trim it, the more compact it gets. Try not to let it get too out of control because it does get uh, pretty uh, messy. But it creates a nice bright green uh, to the tank. And it sort of creeps as well. It creates little runners. So if you put this down like here, it might even start creeping onto the sand a bit down here. But you definitely do have to keep it uh, in check. There's not any rules to this, like other ones. You just plant uh, um, and try and like mix it up a bit as well. So if we, maybe if we have two areas of this plant, it might not look so good. Three areas, once again, just like the rocks, three areas will look better than two or four odd numbers. 
Crips. I, I forgot the Crips. Um, yeah, I think we might add some Crips back here, just behind this uh, hair grass. Cryptocurrency is a really cool plant. You get a lot of variation in cryptocurrency, so there's many, many uh, different varieties of it. Quite popular. You can, it's almost like it become like a collector's plant. And now you say mass crypts. Yeah. They're very easy cryptocurrency as well. And lots of different colors. You can get reds, uh, bright greens. You can get patterns on the leaves, browns. And they all come in different uh, sizes, patterns and shapes, colors. This one right now we're using uh, cryptocurrency undulatus red. Um, it will get a browny red color um, under the right conditions. Obviously we're growing it immersed here. Uh, it's been grown immersed in this uh, nursery pot, so it looks very green. But it will uh, start to get red and reddish brown. Nice plant. Okay, so the Bucephalandra is quite a popular plant. It's, uh, it definitely is becoming a, um, a bit of a collector's item. There's many, many Bucephalandra of weird names. Um, you can get, uh, one of these is Achilles Black. One of them is uh, Kedigang, um, Kedigang Red also called, and it's also called Godzilla. In some places, Bucephalandra Godzilla, you can get uh, many, many names. They, they give them random names. Um, some can be very expensive, um, such as like the Bucephalandra Brownie Ghost 2011, which is only seen once in nature. And it's a very, very purple, very, very purple uh, plant, very unique. And they also grow little flowers. I uh, don't know if we've got any flowers here. We haven't, but uh, they, grow, they also grow flowers quite easily. Very nice plant. And once again, this is just placed on the hardscape. You can plant it, but when you, if you're planting it in soil, you've got to make sure only the roots go in the substrate. There is such a thing called a rhizome. And things like uh, the ferns and anubius and also bucephalandra have this rhizome. It's like a, a thick, stemmy part. Um, if you put this underneath the substrate, the plant will melt. It will just dissolve. So only the roots should be planted if you're doing that. If it has access to the substrate, it will grow quicker. But uh, yeah, you can just plant it onto the hardscape with your hands or whatever, and it does create a nice little uh, effect as well. So just planting it in like here. Very nice. Some nice pieces here as well. So give it a little spray, make sure you keep your plants moist when you're doing your uh, aquascaping before you fill the tank with water. To fill it with water, um, you should really try and do it as slowly as possible. So if you get a jug like this, um, and you start from one corner or maybe on a piece of hardscape, to try and stop the soil all coming down, do it very, very slowly um, until you get a big bit of water in here. You can then put your hand in and pour it on your hand, or you can get like a piece of uh, plastic or something like this, place this down here, then pour the water on the piece of plastic or a piece of packaging, anything, could be paper towels even, um, to stop the uh, water disrupting the soil and disrupting the plants. But I think that's about it. Um, I can obviously talk about the equipment a bit more if you like, uh, we can talk about the water change, but I think we've mentioned that. Um, also, Jordan, once you fill it, how do you decide where to stop your water line? Um, many, peop many people will just fill the tank to the top uh, of the tank, right up to the rim. You can do so, you can uh, just uh, do a bit let a wee bit under, um, it's really up to you. Um, I would say fill it as, as much as you can, um, as much as you dare. Um, but uh, if you have like fish that like to jump, um, be cautious. Um, you might not want to lower it a bit for like a betta fish or something like this. Um, but most fish will be okay. Most fi most small little fish in aquarium stores should be okay if you don't use like tons of flow. And yeah, sometimes they might like to jump, but but this is totally fine if you use if you fill it up to the top. It's totally cool. And then how would you decide which people in the department? How would you do? 
outlets? Inlets and outlets, good, good question, yes. So when you're um, deciding to put your inlets and outlets for your filter, it's important you get a really good circulation around the tank. Um, your diffuser, your CO2 diffuser is very, very important where you place that as well. You want to, if you had your outlets here, so the water was coming out here, and you want to put your CO2 diffuser, an in-tank CO2 diffuser right here so that it's in the highest place of flow. So those little CO2 bubbles will get pushed around the whole way around the tank. For this tank, I probably put my inlet and outlet here. So outlet here gets all the way around the tank and then it comes back straight back to here. You could also put the inlet right here, the uh, inlet right here and the outlet right here, but uh, placing them next to each other is good as well. It's, it's kind of based upon what you can do with this, the tank. So say if my, if my wood was over here, I wouldn't be able to place it here or, you know, it's just totally based upon your hardscape and what's possible. But try and place it in a place where you can get the best circulation, the best movement of CO2. Um, yeah. Any more questions, guys? Feel free. Go ahead. Um, sorry, we came back, but uh, which plants can be planted in substrate? Which need to be planted in substrate? This is what you've done. Sure, sure. I, I believe like al almost all plants can be planted in the substrate. Um, but of course, there's things like the Bucephalandra where you have a rhizome. And the rhizome should not be planted in the substrate or the plant will melt. Um, but even like these ferns, they technically could as long as you don't plant the, sub the rhizome in the substrate. There are plants that do better, like moss, um, on the you know if you attach it to the wood. But also, moss could be laid on top of the substrate. There's not really. I'm, I'm pretty sure there is. There, are, there will be a plant you're not meant to plant in the substrate. Um, but the rhizome is probably the most common answer. Just don't plant the rhizome in the substrate or it melts. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, sure. I'll ask one as well. <laughs> Let's go for it. Um, in terms of what like, fish pairings go well with like aquascaping ferns, I've generally seen that it's usually either less or limited to one or two types. So sure. What would you recommend it? Right, yeah. Um, so smaller schooling fish work really well, especially in smaller tanks. Um, you can obviously put angelfish or things like this in tanks. Be cautious of the temperature these fish need. So if you put like a discus in a planted aquarium, some plants might not like uh, 28 degrees, 30 degrees water. Um, I, I would say like stick to like 22 to 25 degrees if you can. Um, you can add a heater. It, some the WASI filters, um, the, this tank and the cabinet are from, they have inbuilt heaters inside the filter. So that's really good. You can also get in-line uh, heaters that go um, between the piping that goes back in the tank. Um, if you put like a big filter, a big sorry, a big heater inside the tank, it would look kind of ugly. And also the same thing with a, heat, a filter. If you put an in-tank filter, it wouldn't look so nice. Where with aquascaping, we try and uh, um, keep all the equipment out as much as possible. I went off topic there, sorry. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, inline diffusers? Inline diffusers, yes, you can use inline diffusers. They work well in bigger tanks. Um, a lot of uh, smaller tanks, you can just use an in-tank because it's easy to clean. Um, inline diffusers is where you have your filter out, outlet, you know, you have your outlet and it pushes the water out. Um, you can break the tubing, uh, cut, cut the tubing, put an in-tank, uh, inline diffuser in between the tubing, and that gets really good circulation of CO2 inside the tank. But the problem is, it's very hard to clean because then you need to pull the pipes apart, then clean the diffuser, and with uh, you cutting the pipe from the, that goes back into the tank, more chance of leaking as well. So uh, especially for smaller tanks, in-tank in diffuser are perfectly fine. I guess the benefit of an in-line is that you don't see it in the tank. You can also get um, such things as reactors, and they are usually used for much, much larger setups. What kind of size filter would you go to want to take? So when you're sizing your filters up, um, general rule is anywhere between like uh, six times up to ten times turnover per hour. And what I mean like mean by that is, so this this uh, this tank might be a certain amount of liters. It'll be hold a certain amount of water, and you'll want to um, for that water to turn over um, like a certain amount of times per hour. Um, so six times per hour or ten times per hour, somewhere in between there. You can go above and you can go a bit below. It's totally okay. Um, more flow might be more, more likely fish jump or you could maybe lead into BVA issues, um, but uh, it should be okay. Um, that's what I would recommend. So anywhere between six and 10 times, you can go five times, it's totally cool. Um, any more questions, guys? Yeah, keep going, keep going with the questions, it's good. The more questions you ask, the more uh, we get out of this and uh, it'll be, no, we're all good. With an initial tank setup, what kind of filter media would you be looking at? 
So filter media um, is what we put in the filter. It's biological media or sponges. Sponges just uh, stop the waste from like coming back into the tank. It kind of polishes the water, cleans the water. Biological media in the filter is where your but your uh, your bio your bio load for um, your bacteria uh, your bacteria so it will uh, colonize. And this is really important. Um, but a lot of people will just use sponges in their tanks and their filters, and that works well for them. And a lot of people will use just fully um, no sponges and they'll just use biomedia. Um, so it's hard to give you an answer on this one. Me personally, I use a sponge to stop all the debris coming back into my tank and I use biomedia, a good bit of biomedia for the bacteria to colonize. But it's hard to give an answer because people have a wide range of success using different methods. Uh, fish. Fish. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to add fish. Recommendations. Well, we can have some like small tetras, um, small rasbora, something like this. Um, yeah, I think that'd be really nice. We should add some mano shrimp, something that's going to um, help with the algae. Um, so you will get some algae in the startup. I think we talked about this earlier on. You, know, you can get like diatomaceous algae, but a, a small little cleanup crew such as mano shrimp or even uh, like neocaridina, caridina shrimp, um, maybe some snails like nearite snails. They don't reproduce in fresh water, but they do leave the eggs. Um, Nearite snails, especially uh, click on corona snails, they'll leave less eggs, so I'd probably recommend that instead. Um, you could use autosynclus, but autosynclus generally do better in bigger schools in a bigger tank. There's many, many things you could use, but uh, I think the cleanup, cleanup crew first, after about three weeks, four weeks, I think I'm pretty sure ADA do different things. I think they even put uh, the amount of shrimp after two days, but I think they use already cycled uh, media in the filter. In the filter, so that kind of like kick starts the biological uh, growth in the tank. Yeah, but I, if for, for general purpose, everyone just starting a tank from scratch. You've got to let your nitrogen cycle, I'm sure you all have heard about this, the nitrogen cycle to go through its course so this tank is safe for your livestock. I'd say three to four weeks. So once the tank's not burnt out and everything and you need to start actually shaping with your trimming, yeah. what kind of shaping would you go for? So for this tank right now, we've got, we've got stem plants at the back, we've got some uh, um, kind of grassy plants here, we've got some criticrini, some more grassy plants, some booster flandra, which we'll, we'll rarely have to trim unless a leaf is like got algae on it or it's dying, which is quite rare. Um, we've got all this um, uh, hydrocotyl. The hydrocotyl is going to have to be trimmed back quite frequently because we used a lot of it. Um, the microstorm, you're not really going to have to trim the, uh, the pinnatifida. If you trim it more frequently, it'll become more dense and more compact. So that's really, really nice. Um, so definitely, I would recommend trimming the pinnatifida as much as possible the hydrocotyl as much as possible, just to try and keep the shape. Um, we've probably used a bit too much hydrocotyl, I would say, actually. But it looks nice. Um, so the, for the, the cryptocrine, I would probably just trim the bigger leaves and leave the smaller leaves. They'll become more and more compact over time. Um, the hair grass, you don't really need to bother about for a wee bit, but you could trim it as it gets a bit too tall. But it will stay generally this, this height or um, shorter if you trim it. This Liliopsis brasiliensis, I believe it was, um, you could probably just leave this as it is. It'll just get really, really dense and it'll look really nice. The stem plants is what we're really going to be uh, focusing on. So we'll let them grow a wee bit um, and then we'll trim them in half. Then we'll replant the tips, probably. Um, but when it, when you trim a stem plant, it'll grow two new shoots and then you trim it again, you've got four shoots. It'll become more and more and more dense. So that's really good. Um, when you trim it, um, some people will just discard the, the tips, the, the trimmings. But what you could do, once you get a really nice bush and it's all trimmed into a triangular layout, you could plant these little um, stems, these little trimmings, just back into the bush. You don't have to plant them all the way down to the substrate. This could lead to the, the, these little trimmings getting more nutrients from the water column, so you may need to dose a wee bit more in the water column. But uh, it gives a really, well, after trimming, generally looks a bit, a bit sad for itself, and you, it looks like you've just trimmed. But by, um, trim, by adding these little trimmings back into the bush, you can um, get a bit more of a full look, and it doesn't look so, uh, doesn't look like it's just been trimmed. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience? Just one quick thing on the, on the lights. Go ahead. Do you leave the lights on 24-7? Does it help okay. zero or is it half day, like day cycle? Okay, so yeah, that's quite important. Um, for the lighting, I would uh, generally go for anywhere between six to eight hours per day. 
Um, start, starting probably, you can start at eight hours if you want or seven hours, but um, what I do is I start from like six hours and then generally over the first month or the first two months, I'll increase it to eight hours. I generally won't go over eight hours, but you can go over eight hours. To, uh, some people even do 12 hours, but it's, it's, that's, that's a lot of light. For a tank like this, there's not too much plants here. If you had a fully planted tank, like you're growing like for like a farm, Maybe, um, but I would say stick between six to eight hours. And while we're on the topic, I think it's important to talk about CO2 timing as well. So if I went for like an eight hour time period for my uh, light, I would start my, or any time period, six hours to eight hours, it's fine, whatever. Um, I would start my CO2 on two hours before I put my lights on. So CO2, CO2 would come on before the lights, two hours before. The, um, what that does is it gives a good time for the CO2 to ramp up. When the lights turn on, the plants can instantly use the CO2 because the CO2 is at a good level for the plants to start using. Very, very important. And then at the end of the day, I would switch my CO2 off one hour before my light switch off. This just saves a little bit of CO2 and there's already enough CO2 in the water for the last hour, so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, yeah, so CO2 on two hours before lights, maybe have a six to eight hour lighting period and switch your CO2 off one hour before your lights. If you don't remember it, don't forget to just, if you just message me on Instagram, I can always repeat this for you guys. Yeah, cool. Any more questions? We're all good. Yay, oh, I've got one. At times you get a bit of a surface sort of film. Surface film, yeah. So a surface film is a protein slick on the top of the tank. It gives many names for it. Um, some people call it CO2 slick, but I, there's nothing really to do with the CO2, but the CO2 can get trapped underneath this protein film, protein, uh, the slick oil film on the top of the tank. Um, and this stops the CO2 from gassing off and there can be problems with livestock being gassed and it's not good. So you want a clear surface. You can add a skimmer. Um, you can add a skimmer that's on the uh, inlet or outlet of the pipe filter. You can also buy a skimmer for inside the tank. But also, if this, isn't a, if this is a, you don't want to do this, you can add a, um, an air stone and run the air stone at night after the, when the lights switch off and don't, don't put the air stone on when the CO2 switches on two hours before. Switch, this, switch the uh, air stone off before the CO2 turns on in the morning as well. Um, this will um, create bubbles on the surface. It will break up this um, protein film on the top of the tank and uh, by the next day you won't have any protein film. I don't know if there's any, other, they can do other things. So you can take like a, this isn't really a, this is a quick solution, but uh, it's not a long-term solution. I would use the skimmer or use the, um, the uh, bubbler or even what ADA do is they raise their pipes at nighttime. They actually lift the pipes up. So the pipes sit on, like they'll splash the water on the surface and that also really helps. And then they'll lower them when the uh, CO2 comes back on. You can take a bucket like this and you, or a glass and you can slowly just put it underneath the water line and you'll slowly see the oil film come into the, uh, the little, uh, um, whatever you use, glass or whatever. And you can slowly get it off like this. It's not a long-term solution, it'll come back. You can also put paper towels on the top of the tank and then discard them, that also helps, but that's uh, wasteful, I guess. Um, yeah, and only a short-term solution. What about maintenance water changes? Maintenance water changes, um, I'm not sure if I went through that, but yeah, we've, I followed the ADA guidelines. So in the first month, like right now, I would fill this tank up and I would do one third water change every day in the first week, every second day in the second week, every third day in the third week, and then I would do it once a week after that. You can do more water changes, and that's, that's, that's totally cool. And you can even do 50%, that's totally fine as well. Just be cautious um, that you're removing more nutrients if you're doing larger water changes, more water changes. And it's probably better, if you are doing larger water changes and more water changes, um, make sure your parameters that you're putting back in, the water you're putting back into the tank is closer to the water in the tank because you don't want fluctuations of parameters too much, really. But it is okay to do larger water changes. Um, Maintenance-wise, maintenance is really, really important. Make sure you're um, moving around the, the plants, trimming the plants, but also make sure you're removing all the fish waste. Um, algae is a huge problem if you don't remove the fish waste. So you can move your hand around the tank like this. You can get um, a little turkey baster and stir up the substrate. You can uh, brush the um, algae if you have algae or anything on the wood to clean the wood with a toothbrush or a, a metal brush, um, especially a metal brush for the rocks. Maybe that would help. Um, what else? Yeah, and just make sure you're removing all that fish waste, all that dead plant matter. If there's a leaf that's dying, pluck it off. Um, it's better removing this dead plant matter because the dead dying plant matter will just attract algae and it doesn't look very nice anyway. Yeah. So how, how 
how do you stir up without destroying or damaging the root structures of the plants? How do you how, how do you clean it without? Um, I guess uh, for the carpeting plants, it's quite easy. When it carpets, you can even choose uh, like a siphon and just properly. You know how people like siphon gravel. You've seen it done, they use a big siphon. You can do that on the, the carpet, and it gets all the waste out of the carpet. Same with this car a grassy plant, you could totally do that. For the stem plants, it's kind of hard to get underneath. So you could get like a, um, a turkey baster and kind of like put it underneath and squish it, and then the dirt would like come out the sides and you can try and remove the water, dirty water like that. Um, but it shouldn't be too hard to, um, you, you, you shouldn't really be breaking the plants. Um, just give it a light wave with your hand as well over like things like this. Um, to dislodge any waste organics. You can always come to come up to me afterwards, after the show, and uh, ask any questions you want, or find me online. And uh, my name is Jordan Stidit. You'll be able to find me online, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.